All right, folks. Welcome to the Getting Your Edge podcast. My name is Dennis. And hi, I'm Judy Grattan. And we're here to help you right size your home and your life. And welcome back, everyone. Hi, I'm Dennis Day with my co-host, Judy Gratton. Say hi, Hello, Judy. Dennis. Hi, how you doing? We are here with our, we've got a full team here. This we is do. amazing. All That's three of us. Yeah. Welcome, Jim Gratton. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. And Glad to be this anywhere. Is, this <laughs> is episode 20 of Getting Your Edge, How to Right Size Your Home and Life podcast. And we are here to help you. And we have changed brokerages. We are now with an international brokerage called EXP. Mm -hmm. Same great service. In fact, I think this is going to be an improvement to our business because we are learning so much. So yeah. what are we here today? We are here to talk about downsizing your wine collection. Ooh, yes. La, la. And I'm really excited about this, this topic because I know absolutely nothing about wine other than it's made from grapes. <laughs> uh, start. <laughs> and uh, so I'm really excited to hear what you have to say, Jim, about yeah. someone, you know, just taking care of your wine collection. Sure. So that it is well treated well during the downsizing process. Why don't you give us a heads up on who you are and how you became an expert at the wine industry? Well, uh, Dennis, I was involved in the wine industry from uh, 1981 until 2018. Um, so 37 years, if I'm doing my math uh, correctly, I was a wine steward for a couple of years. Then I worked for a wine distributor, uh, one particular wine distributor for uh, 17 years and uh, later uh, another distributor and then uh, various wine importers uh, as a Northwest regional manager. So I was responsible for seven to nine states. Um, in, in our area uh, and uh, getting wine to them from uh, all parts of the world. Uh, and I've also worked for a couple of Washington uh, wineries too. Um, sounds like I flitted around, but that was uh, 37 years of, of uh, being in the wine business, uh, during which there have been a lot of changes, especially here in the state of Washington. Um, uh, back in the 1990s, it was actually illegal to sell your uh, wine collection. And in the 1990s, there was a gentleman named Rand Seeley who uh, owned a, a wine shop then uh, called Esquin, which is still around and, and uh, quite a nice uh, place. And he petitioned the Washington State uh, Liquor Control Board to be able to sell uh collections from from his his clients uh which was kind of funny because you would see wines that you had sold or i had sold to esquin and then purchased by customers come back uh even after they were long gone and they were into several vintages later uh but so it's now legal to to do just that to go to uh, a wine shop uh there are there are several in Seattle including Esquin um uh city sellers in Wallingford and a number of others that will uh uh evaluate your uh collection and uh and may accept part of it may accept all of it uh uh on basically on a consignment uh, they sell it uh, and take obviously take their cut and and uh, and then then pay you after it's uh, after it's depleted. But if you're a serious collector and you have uh, say many many cases of wine, uh, let's let's say a, a collection that exceeds 
you know, is into the hundreds of bottles, uh, and you suddenly realize uh, as you're getting older that uh, if you drank each uh, a bottle a day, um, you would never get through all of it. At that point, you know, you've got to either think that, well, my children are going to want this, or you can say, maybe it's time I sold this. Thomas Jefferson famously said, um, leave the house and the money to your children. Drink the wine yourself. And the idea behind that famous statement was that your children are unlikely to appreciate the wine as much as you do. So there are lots of other ways to uh, to downsize your collection um, and, and many, many reasons for doing so. Um, a lot of that, uh, you know, there's, there's, I mean, money might be in, you know, an, an, an incentive, but there are also incentives, uh, you know, if you want to, uh, if there's wine that you collected that you didn't particularly care for, and you want to sell that portion, or you want to make room for more wine collecting, and you just are out of room for storage, uh, there are many reasons to go, you know, to, um, to a source to be able to uh, to to downsize your your collection. Uh, if you're if you're a serious serious collector with hundreds of bottles and and uh, famous names that sort of thing, you might want to contact one of the auction houses. Uh, Christie's or Sotheby's um, come to mind. Uh, they all have different rules and different uh, uh, methods. So you need to contact them uh, directly, and and they they do this all the time. I mean, this is nothing. Uh, you're not uh, approaching them at something they're they're not um, set up to do. Uh, there are also online uh, uh, firms um, that uh, do this as well, and um, they are easily accessible by looking online and just typing in, you know, how to how to uh, sell your your wine collection. Uh, but uh, just for uh, some names, uh, there's J.J. Buckley Fine Wines, which is in Oakland, um, and uh, Brentwood Wine Company, which is also affiliated with Cellar Tracker, which is a popular wine site, um, and they have methods for um, for evaluating your wine, uh, you can reach out to them, uh, tell them what you have. Uh, they will uh, evaluate what uh, what your wine is, what vintage is, and then get back to you with a uh, evaluation, and then arrange for transport of the wines from from your uh, cellar. Prior to doing that, I would I would advise you to first look at. Uh, some wine valuation sites so that you know what the value is of your wines. Um, it's often, uh, you know, you think, you, you time, sometimes think that you your wine's more valuable than what the the market really thinks. Same with houses, you know. It's, the seller always thinks that their, their, uh, their thing is unique. Um, but the, on the the flip side of that is that we often remember what we paid for something, think that it has increased in value, and um, and it has increased in value more than you ever thought. Um, I, I went on to a site called uh, wineowners.com forward slash valuations, and you can type in any wine that you have, uh, as long as you know the name of the wine and the vintage. Um, and it will it will uh, tell you what the market is for that wine. If there's no market, that's they'll tell you that too. It'll come up in pounds because it's a British uh, uh, thing. But they they uh, it, you know, there's a little button in the corner you can change it to dollars and and um, and get a, a quick valuation. Now the valuation is uh, also they have, they have on there a, a, a handy little thing too. They'll give you an evaluation, and then they'll give you the selling history of it recently. And almost always, the selling history is less than what it's worth now. So when you look at a wine, uh, so for instance, I typed in um, 
a couple of wines that I own, uh, Chateau Palmer, uh, which is a, more, uh, uh, a wine from the Margot region of Bordeaux, uh, 1985, our daughter's birth year. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the valuation uh, for that is $3,805. But, uh, and then another wine I typed in, Penfolds Grange. I used to work for Penfolds uh, in 1999. And uh, the value of that is $4,902. Now, it's never sold for that. So the highest it's ever sold for is $4,400. It's about $500 less. And the same for the Margot. It's never sold for $3,800 either. Uh, about $3,200. So, the valuations are based on what they think the 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 uh, wine hit continues to accrue in value, but that doesn't mean that it's what it's going to sell for. Same as a house, you know, we we come up with a valuation of a house, and oftentimes it sells for somewhat less than what we uh, put it on and, and listed it for. So uh, it's it's a there's a lot of uh, resources out there online, um, and it, you know the 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 one thing that that is always a problem is transporting wine during the summer. Wine uh, does not like heat. What happens when a bottle gets warm? Besides, it it's it's not good for the wine inside. Is the cork well? Uh, uh, will leak. Uh, and there's nothing that destroys the value of a bottle of wine other, after it's been a leaker. And, and it, a, an auction house or anyone else is going to easily determine, they're going to look at the, the capsule, they're going to look at the, the, uh, the condition, and they can tell if it's ever been a leaker. Because it once it's leaked, it, it, it gets in the uh, on the capsule and it's also visible on the cork too so that would that would any any wine that's a leaker even if it was a uh, penfolds grange worth 4500 4, uh is worth uh, nothing if it's been a leaker so in getting rid of your uh uh collection it might be better to wait and do it in the cooler months of the year, or if you're desperate to do it during this time of year, you should probably look at your local sources first. Okay, you, I've grown on. If you yeah. wanted to, if you wanted to wait until the uh, cooler months of the year, aren't there places like Esquin? I think also has storage where you can store your collection. Correct. Yes, they uh, Esquin has uh, uh, the uh, well. There are two very large wine storage uh, facilities in Seattle. Esquin is is one of the two. Uh, there's another one uh, in South Lake Union. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but it's like uh, Seattle Wine Storage, something like that. It's certainly if you uh, Google Seattle Wine Storage, uh, both of those will come up, and they have temperature controlled. Uh, places for you to store your wine uh, and uh, secure locations. Um, and it, the 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 thing that uh, that that when we get back to selling your collection, um, important thing to to um, uh, for the value of the wine is to assess what we call provenance, and that is where did you buy it. At, at what price? If you have your receipts, that's a good thing. Um, where was it stored all this time? Uh, most houses do not have um, uh, perfect storage conditions. Now, a lot of new construction has, especially in the uh, luxury end, has uh, gorgeous wine cellars with temperature and humidity controls. Uh, and that would be something that to be able to, to brag on in terms of my my wine that I'm uh, uh, trying to sell here has been stored in pristine condition. And that adds to its value too. Uh, and not pristine conditions. Oh, well, I kept it in a, in a uh, uh, coat closet for, you know, and I looked at it every once in a while and, you know, 
was it stored on its side? All, all these things are, are uh, considerations in terms of valuation. Um, so, and many um, uh, the, the, these places like uh, the auction houses and, and Brentwood Wine Company, they have experts who can evaluate wine. They know, for instance, one of the things that happens with wine over time is it uh, it can evaporate. And what that does is increase the distance between uh, the cork and where the wine starts. That's called oulage. And if the oulage is down more than what the auction house thinks is right for that vintage and that era of wine, uh, they probably won't won't accept it or will sell it at a reduced uh, price. Hmm. Well, I was just thinking when you were talking about these storage units, I mean, if you were going to stay in a specific area or the area that you were in had those storage units, you could conceivably not downsize your collection and yes. just store them in those storage units instead, although that would, would cost you money. But so if you if you are going to downsize your collection and let's say you love everything that's in there, is there a way that you can prioritize which wines to keep and which ones to let go of in that downsizing process? Well, uh, uh, my father, uh, the, one of the uh, last times I was uh, uh, at his uh, condominium, I had I was working for uh a company uh called Delille, uh famous Washington winery that produces very high end wines uh lovely wines and uh I dropped off a couple of bottles uh after uh participating in a in a uh trade tasting in sun valley um and I said, you know these wines are are wonderful now you know if you want to open them then, you know please go ahead. Or they'll they'll be even better in five years, and he said, "Don't give me any wine that needs to age for five years. I don't even buy green bananas." <laughs> so he was in his nineties then. So, uh, but in any case, so th that that gets me back to the answer of your question, which is um, those one you you know uh, wine review. Uh, journals uh, will often give you an, a range of age of a wine, and you, you can certainly uh, look those up online too. If you've got wines, you know, if you're if you're downsizing and you want your, you know, you you want to drink what what you have left, you know, you want to you want to go with the wines that are supposedly at their maturity. We never know for certain, and no one knows until you open a bottle whether it's you know it it will you open it too early or too late. And oftentimes, uh, uh, if you keep you keep a wine for for too long a period of time, uh, you find that uh, it's not what you expected. Many many people uh, think they they want to age wines, and they think that they well, when the wines age that they mature in an upward uh, uh, fashion where they're always getting better. And that's not the case at all. Like, it's more like uh, it's more like going in and out, in and out and little improvements. Sometimes the wine is like ready to drink for about six months and then goes into a dead phase uh, where it, you know, when you open it, it's like, well, what happened here? But another six months or a year later, it's, it's drinking wonderfully. Um, so it's it's always a kind of a crapshoot of, of what to keep and what what to uh, what to drink and uh, what could last. Um, so are there what, any are there any factors, anything you can give people that would help them to determine which wines have the potential to age well and which you know which wine, wines are worth keeping for a longer period of time? Is it like could you say that Chardonnays are worth keeping or Merlots last lot, age better? Is something like that? Well, uh, yeah. Uh, generally, uh, white wines uh, are, and people don't drink white wines. I mean, they, aging white wines uh, is 
you know, it's kind of a, a perilous thing. Uh, certainly, you know, the, the wines change, uh, all, all wines as they age um, tend to uh, uh, lose fruit. And, and I often say when people talk to me about wanting to age wines, I, I'll ask them if they like aged wines. Young, uh, fruity wines are what we normally drink. If you're buying, you know, as most people, you know, they most people age wine on the drive home from the grocery store or the wine <laughs> shop, and and uh, and that's it. And you know, so when they taste an older wine and the fruit it, it has become more one part of a of a whole instead of the dominant part of of the of the experience. Uh, they're they're taken aback, and it's like, well, you know, I didn't. Where's the fruit? Yeah, well, the fruit recedes with with age. The other thing that that happens is if anything is out of balance, if a wine is, uh, it, it makes you you pucker because it's, well, it's a, it's got tannic a tannic acid that is out of balance with the rest of the of the wine. A lot of it used to be thought that that would mean that the wine would age well. Well, it also it, it doesn't recede over time. So anything that's out of balance, you don't want to age. But but getting back to your your question, white wines uh, generally used to be thought of as you know keep them around for three years. That's baloney, uh, especially wines like uh, German Rieslings will age for decades and get better and better and better. Uh, I, I had a wine, um, when I was at the German Wine Academy in 1986, that the, the first wine they, they poured us at our going away was a German Riesling, uh, from 1969 that tasted more like, uh, a rich, uh, Chardonnay based wine from, uh, from the Burgundy region of, of France and, um, just stunning. So there, there was a wine that was uh, 17 years old at that time. Uh, so white wines can age. It, it, there's a, many factors about whether you should do that or not. But generally, I think most people don't want to age uh, white wines because they, uh, they, they don't really care for them when they're older. Um, and, and, you know, you know it's, it's funny. I mean, they're, they're, the sellability of uh, older white wines is not high either. Um, they're, they're always, they're more of a crapshoot than, than red wines. The, um, the uh, red wines, uh, generally Cabernet-based wines, Merlot-based wines, uh, tend to age uh, better. Uh, the, it, Petite Syrah, Syrah do, do age as well. Uh, uh, Pinot Noir, I generally think is a six to seven year aging is is about right for it to be at its optimum uh, drinking. But that's there's many many great great uh, uh, Burgundy wines made from Pinot Noir that age for for decades and and uh, are are wonderful. So it's it's uh, it's always a, a crapshoot, but um, when you when you age uh, white wines, you're you're probably uh, uh, you're, you're probably taking more of a chance than aging most red wines. Now, in terms of of uh, aging, you know, there's no reason on earth to age most uh, red wines made today. They're they're um, they're not. Most winemakers are making wines that the public will buy and enjoy right now. They if they buy them at a restaurant that they love them with their food, and they they're not particularly interested with in in you know in aging. They do a lot of them do age well, but we, they're, they're made. Most wines are made to be consumed young, and um, and and. Especially wines of uh, you know under a certain price point are 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 definitely not ever thought of as as long agers. So, Jim, are there regions, France, California, that age better or have more value and over time? Yes. Yeah, so that's uh, that is certainly the case with uh, uh, supply and demand. Now there are many 
collected a collective collection type of wines out of California that are they're they're beyond boutique. They are in the stratosphere of prices and are certainly trophy wines. And it, those those wines are highly sought after. But uh, for wines that are commonly available, uh, you know, the, some of these wines like uh, uh, Screaming Eagle in, out of Napa Valley, I think they produce around, uh, I, I'd have to check, but it's probably no more than about 2,500 cases. Well, the the wines that uh, uh, are, are not uh, uh, like that, that are in higher demand are, are French uh, wines out of Bordeaux um, and Burgundy that are from uh, uh, what we call a classified gross. Uh, in 1855, the, the uh, Bordelais decided to implement uh, or, or enshrine uh, in uh, categories one through five, first growth, second growth, third growth, fourth growth, and fifth growth, the wines that were getting the highest prices at that point. And uh, there, there are only now five uh, first growths, and those are Chateau Margaux, Chateau Aubryon, uh, Chateau Lafitte, uh, Chateau uh, Mouton Rothschild. Anyway, <laughs> so those wines are cost around a thousand dollars a vintage uh, per, per per bottle these days. Um, and if you have those in older vintages, the, their their prices are are generally beyond that. So Bordeaux uh classified gross and there's a there's a bordeaux is a large large winemaking region these classified gross uh all of them produce around 35,000 to 40,000 cases of vintage so they're not totally uh, uh you, you know in the if you make 2000 cases and and you get some gigantic review you know there's there's no way to get a hold of a bottle but with with uh, Bordeaux, it only takes it takes money, uh, and there there are lots of factors that uh, affect that, like uh, uh, the, how how much the Chinese are buying these days, and and uh, how how much you know demand there is worldwide for these particular Bordeaux. In uh, in Burgundy, which uh, the simple thing about Burgundy is that the white wines are made from Chardonnay and the red wines are made from Pinot Noir. The, then after that it gets it gets really difficult. Um, but there are classifications not of wineries, but of uh, unlike uh, Bordeaux, there are classifications of uh, vineyards. So vi the vineyards are uh, there. There are wines that are basically village wines. It's something like a Jeffrey Chambertin is from that village. Well, then as you go up the hillsides. The the next level up uh, uh, generally um, is uh, not always, uh, but anyway, the Premier Cru, which sounds like it ought to be. Wow, that's the first. And then there's Grand Cru. Grand Cru is the most highly sought after Burgundy. So um, the wines of uh, Domaine Romani Conti, for instance, are uh, thousands of dollars a bottle. Uh, didn't used to be that way when I was first in the wine business. Uh, in fact, uh, from the, the 1982 vintage of Bordeaux, I could you could buy Mouton and, and Margot for $39.95 wholesale, which translates to about uh, $55 a bottle. Now they are in the thousands. So those regions are highly regarded. Italy is a, uh, has another, has regions... Um, most particularly Piedmont, where uh, Barolo and Barbaresco are are made, uh, those wines generally uh, uh, get uh, a lot, get quite a uh, a bit of attention and uh, and 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 value. Chianti Classico, uh, Reservas, and some of the uh, the wines that uh, uh, that are are made with. Uh, Blends featuring Cabernet and other other things with Sangiovese are th those are are highly regarded as well too. German in Germany there are a number of uh, you know highly regarded areas as well too. 
California and uh, it primarily Nampa Valley. Uh, there are other regions too that that get um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, attention as far as value and uh, you know it's it's next to impossible to find a Napa Valley Cabernet that isn't you know at least close to a hundred dollars these days. So Jim, are people investing and speculating on these like they would say gold or baseball cards or uh, yeah, Bitcoin yeah. Some yep. stuff like that? Yes, indeed. Um, there are um, <laughs> there are a number of uh, places that facilitate buying um buying well not necessarily just collections but uh buying out of the the bordeaux wine market uh, bordeaux is kind of unusual in that they they generally don't exclusively go with any uh one importer the the classified gross are available to any importer who wants to to buy them and so there are are like real estate investment trusts uh there are or organizations that do nothing but buy and sell uh collections of wine and perhaps they they uh, commit to buying 10 cases of of uh uh chateau margot and uh it, you know out of the next vintage that seems like it's getting you know terrific reviews and then they never see the wine they never they never take possession of the wine they store it in in um, in, in most most often they, they store Bordeaux and that sort of thing in Europe, um, so that the wine doesn't doesn't travel that much. Uh, travel is not a thing that's all that beneficial to wine. But so uh, there there are yeah there are firms that are buying wine uh, left and right, and, and they've driven up the price of a lot of things uh, for. You know, wine lovers like me who just want to, you know, want to buy a bottle, have a great bottle of wine, and and drink it at some point. They are, you know, their their ability with their uh, resources to buy these wines and and uh, without the intention of ever uh, drinking them or even touching them is is certainly it's it's been the the valuations of wine as I I mentioned, you know, like when I in nineteen. Uh, 84 or 85 when when uh the 82 bordeaux were first released and, you know you could buy this first gross for very little money well if you held on to the 1982 vintage which was the highest rated vintage well uh, it made robert parker the the famous uh, wine critic he he evaluated um uh the 1982s uh in his little small publication called wine advocate uh, and as uh, the, the first 100 point vintage, and that's and he rates wines on a 100 point scale, the first 100 point vintage, and the prices just started escalating. And now they, uh, you know, if you'd bought a case of 1982 uh, Margot or Lafitte or Mouton Rothschild, you would be able to sell that for probably more than most houses cost now. No, but in any case, they 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 uh, the the they've outpaced the uh, the stock market, the real estate market in the percentage of uh, of growth, um, and so that has attracted a lot of people who you know just want to make money. It's not it has nothing to do with with whether they love wine or not. Well, so uh, you know, one thing I just wanted to clarify when you mentioned the Chinese when their economy started to grow. They became wine connoisseurs as well, and so their their population is so much larger than many other countries. It, they really did begin to buy up quite a bit of the wine, and that definitely changed the prices all over the world. Whereas they hadn't up until that point, when their economy wasn't quite as strong as it yeah. was. I'm not exactly sure where it is today. But um, but it is wine is definitely something that people can invest in, not just for enjoyment, but for financial gain. I had a question for you on the French wines and particularly I know that uh, climate change has has had a definite effect on grape growing. And so is that affecting the you know scarcity of some of these wines because they're no longer able to produce to the degree that they were before because of 
climate change issues, you know, change in rain and heat and whatnot. Is that? Well, it's, has it, that it, yeah, and, and it's uh, it's a more long term uh, uh, effect, um, but many, many places are preparing for it. In fact, I just read today that uh, the French region of Alsace, which is famous for uh, Riesling and Gewürztraminer and white wines, um, primarily they they produce Pinot Noir for some years, but mostly white wines. And the uh, the French the French have a very have a, uh, very strict uh, rules uh, uh, which are enforced by the, the the government on what can be grown where. So a a, a, a person who owns a, a vineyard in Burgundy cannot decide to rip out his Pinot Noir and plant Cabernet. It's not legal. In Alsace, oh. in Alsace, they've just uh, this week allowed for experimentation with the, the grape Syrah, which is a, a, a grape that really likes hot weather. Alsace does not have hot weather. It is, uh, it is right on the border with Germany, and it's a very cool growing area. Um, and uh, but that's an indication of, of climate change. And they there's a lot of discussion that, you know, the, the, the hot summers that what, what happens when, uh, when when the temperature goes over 100 degrees, grapes shut down. They they don't progress in their in their um, in their ripening. Uh, they basically decide that this is this is going to kill us if it stays like this. That's that's the only re reason or only way that uh, Eastern Washington uh, can produce really wonderful wines is that we have that that those hot days, but we have really cool nights where it cools down into the fifties and the the grapes cool off and then they warm up gradually. Um, but in other areas, uh, Bordeaux, for instance, has had uh, vintage after vintage where the warming climate has made it possible to have really terrific vintages year after year, where which is not they're still worried about uh, what is going to what's going to happen down the road, uh, and and uh, Burgundy is as well. Many uh, uh, places that were ideal for growing cooler grapes are now uh, starting to see that it's it's not uh, it's not going to last. So there's a lot of planning going on and a lot of experimentation. Uh, you know, we have leading universities like the University of California, Davis and Washington State University here that are are uh, experimenting with different grape varieties uh, with the intention of developing varieties that we may not even be familiar with right now. Uh, you know, Italy has 3,000 different uh, uh, vinifera uh, grapes, which is grapes that produce wine, not table grapes. And uh, we're, we're they're looking at at what grapes are going to survive well as we as the planet heats up. And uh, you know, one or two degrees difference, and uh, uh, it's going to it's going to really widely affect the world of wine. There'll be lots of places where we don't think of them, you know, as as great wine producers that are going to be uh uh more ideal for for uh growing and, and like uh british columbia and uh the lake o okanagan uh region they're they're getting warm uh, warm enough days now that they're not they're not producing uh uh you know rieslings and or, well they are producing rieslings and and uh pinot gris and other other wines like that where they're starting to look at you know we we're, we can we can do cabernet with the best of of Washington because we're it's getting warmer here. So will climate change affect the the, the price of fine wine that's the that's already been produced? It may increase the value so because of this transition period. Well, supply and demand. Um, uh, I I I think that you know it's I, I mean there are many um, seeing a. a Guy who has more money than God apparently uh, had a uh, tasting that one of my friends was invited to a uh, Facebook friends and and he was decrying you know that the 
post uh, mid eighties uh, Bordeaux as as having been ruined by Robert Parker and his his love of Parker really loved uh, big rich hitch in the face. Uh, wines uh, and he the more he and because he was so highly regarded as a reviewer when he would give wines uh, you know upper 90s that were big fat and rich and un unlike what Bordeaux is known for which is finesse and elegance more and more producers started to change to that and so the wines for those people who like their Bordeaux to be uh, more about elegance and less about power they those wines are more highly valued but you know the there's a diminishing supply of things like that so well so getting back to downsizing because that's what we're about if someone were moving into a, another home where let's say they don't have access to a wine cellar in their home and they don't have access to storage units within a wine company what are some suggestions of ways that they could store their wine in their new home and keep it? I mean, where's the best place in the home? The best yeah. place. Well, if if you have a basement, uh, that's you know that's probably the best place to uh, to be. Um, the the what wine uh, likes is a cool uh, environment. Uh, you know, we are fortunate in the Northwest, uh, in Western Washington, in Western Oregon, uh, to have uh, a reasonably cool um, uh, climate. We, of course, we do get a few hot days, and and um, those are not really uh, kind to uh, to to wine. So, what you wanted to have it, you know, is if there's if there's air conditioning, well, you know, keep them in a in a dark area where uh it, it's it stays cool um obviously if you don't have air conditioning a basement is probably the most uh likely place to store your wine if you uh if you don't have a basement you want to look for the the place that is uh coolest in the house uh, what you light you said dark you want you want dark light is uh, you, you know it's is uh I mean, temp light temporarily when you go into a cellar or whatever is, is no big deal. But but the, the they should be resting in the dark. The the they they should have a consistent humidity. Um, this is not something I've ever been able to achieve. Uh, but we you know it, it is it's best to keep the the wine uh, as uh, in relatively cool temperatures. Definitely, uh, if it, if the house is heating up, uh, you know, it, I mean, like the heat dome we had uh, a couple of years ago that, you know, where we had temperatures of 110 and most of us didn't have air conditioning. Those were those are kind of th th things that that really uh, could hurt wine. Now, uh, another thing that that is a. Uh, a, a terrifically good investment is to buy a wine uh, refrigerator, which uh, can keep your wine, especially you, you know the value the bottles you value the most. You know they they have small ones that have that hold you know uh, maybe two cases on one side and two cases on another side, uh, and then there's there's big big large ones too. Um, and and there you have you know you'll have a, a door that's shaded and so that light doesn't really get in there and a, a constant temperature and a constant humidity. It's where I keep my most valuable bottles. And unfortunately, uh, I, I you know I unless, until I drink one, then I don't have room to put any others in there. Uh, but that's that was a is a re, you know if you could say when you go to downsize, well these these 24 bottles of, of uh, Penfolds Grange were stored in a, in a uh, locked uh, wine uh, cooler for the last, uh, you know, 10 years, 15 years. That's going to, that's going to help in terms of their, of their value. Cool. And if you get a family who say the wine collector passes on and this right. family is left with this collection they don't know things about wine. They right. don't have the interest. Are there ways that they could say donate this wine to you know a good cause? 
Uh, well, yes, there are lots of. Uh, in fact, I, I was when I was uh, uh, working for wine importers. Uh, I I got uh, and, and Delil was another one. Uh, every auction, uh, you know, for uh, some little school somewhere called wanting, you know, could you make a donation? Like, you know, uh, like, you know, that wasn't uh, it wasn't a business. In fact, with Delil. Uh, we were, we were uh, uh, at, at the time I worked for them. They were about a twelve thousand case winery. They were expanding and uh, and were about twenty thousand when I left. They actually produced a wine to be for the to, for these specific purposes uh, to you know to let uh, a charity have have this wine to sell. Uh, you can donate, and uh, you know if if you think about uh, the the I mean, it, it make, make this donation. Uh, make sure it's written. Make sure there's you've got a receipt for the fact that you donated. Uh, you know, a, a, a 1985 uh, Chateau Lafitte Rothschild. Uh, that that you that would give you a tax deduction uh, of you know a considerable amount. Um, uh, so it's it's you know it's a it's a really um, it's a it can you know you don't you can donate them um, fair I mean that's the easiest thing to do to to rid yourself of a, of the wine if you're not a wine drinker and you know you've got these wines to to deal with but um, you know so it's, it can go to any any place you wanted it if you wanted Children's Hospital they would probably take it for an auction if you wanted. Uh, public or you know PBS, they'd probably take it for an auction type thing. Yes, yeah. There are so many uh, places that have auctions. Children's Hospital would be an uh, excellent example, and especially those uh, places that uh, rely on donations. Uh, anyway, I mean, you know, I when I got hit up for you know uh, the school such and such fund and you know it, 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 I, I didn't I never bothered with uh you know with a uh, tax deduction or anything like that but you know if you're going to donate uh something of of uh, considerable value you probably want to go to a, a, a PBS or NPR or um uh children's hospital others that are set up to take donations like that um and I'm sure there's there's Ten hundred, a thousand more. I I didn't mention that would would be set up for that sort of thing. Are Are you saying all those donations your wife asked you to donate when our kids were in school? <laughs> Maybe those. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, fortunately, with the uh, with the wine importers that I worked for, um, they they thought of uh, they they had already uh, been hit up enough that they uh produced certain things for donations that were were rarities uh with penfolds we had um uh, a magnum which is 1.5 liters uh of a uh one of their uh bin wines uh uh Kalimna Shiraz that came in a wood box with a with a, a plexiglass front so it was not something that anyone else could buy and you know that's what you know when you when you go to the the uh, wine auction at uh, uh, Chateau Saint Michel for the Washington uh, uh, wine auction that's happening this month, the things that they have uh, for bidding on are unusual things: six liter bottles of of wine, that sort of thing. And uh, all the wineries are used to getting hit up for these things people forget that you know it's a business and you got to make money and you you're asking them to give away their product for you know name recognition which none of them need you know, so anyway well so if you are considering you know if you are going to downsize your collection whether you're donating it or selling it are there any pitfalls are there any things that you should be careful not to do are there any well, uh, you know, there are many. Like, for instance, you said be careful of how how they travel in the yeah, summer months. So yeah, maybe certainly. you want to do. So, 
if you if you if you have a large collection and or, uh, or you know you're let's say even you know even four or five cases that you want to rid yourself of that are are uh, you know valuable wines you've gone on to to wineowners.com valuations and found that you know gee I you know I could I could walk away at ten thousand dollars here and then you reach out to seller tracker and uh, they put you in in touch with the uh, Brentwood Wine Company, they're going to arrange for transport. And that transport may be, um, you know, sorry, we don't do anything in July and August. Um, you know, uh, with, with when I worked for DeLille, we, did, we, we relied a lot on uh, direct-to-consumer DTC uh, sales, uh, but we didn't ship anything we we anything we sold during the summer months we just held on to and then in september when it was cool and if it wasn't cool like if you're shipping to phoenix and it's still in the hundreds no not going until the temperature drops and so you know you may very well find yourself in a situation where they're they're telling you okay we we will accept this um uh, uh and we're going to arrange for transportation but it won't be until october and nice. you go, okay, I'm, no. well, and another thing that comes to, I mean, I would probably recommend that this is not something that anybody would ever consider putting on Facebook marketplace or offer up or Craigslist. No, no and, and, I'm sure there are people out there who um, could look at that as a really easy theft well, of something. You and, know, I mean, I wouldn't it, just let people come to my home right. and look at my wine collection and and buy whatever, because I don't think it would necessarily be safe. Is your, what wine, your wine collection? Not my <laughs> wine collection. Your wine collection. <laughs> anyway, uh, it, it is illegal to sell wine yourself uh-huh. in, okay. in this state and in most states in the union. You need to go through. A, a wine shop, a licensed retailer, and as I said, it used to be illegal to do that. Uh, uh, but but now in in the state, it's legal to do that. But you can you if if you put something up on, and I think most platforms don't allow you to put up any alcoholic beverages. Um, I may be wrong on that, and but on uh, I would I would think because there's legalities involved, they would take that down. Uh, pretty quickly and and i don't know of a state in the union that allows allows you to sell wine yourself unless you're a licensed retailer hey jim we have uh companies that come in and do estate sales we Uh actually had a estate sale person on our podcast very early in our and they come in look at your furniture and your jewelry and your china and and your 1960s toys apparently and they evaluate it then they do a you know an estate sale is there something like that in the wine industry well uh the estate sale people that i know of have um have contacts they would uh they, they would not attempt to val- evaluate your collection in terms of its of its uh value um i know of one instance where uh uh estate sale people came in and and they uh brought in a uh, uh someone from uh, i'm not sure if it was from esquin uh or uh or where but they came in some to someone to evaluate the wines and they um they basically said that about a quarter of this particular client's wines was sellable, you know, had any market value at all. There was, you know, magnums of of stuff that were, uh, you know, from wineries that don't don't produce wines to age <laughs> and no value whatsoever. So they ended up, uh, I, I believe they ended up trashing a, a, a number of the wines. Uh, that had no value because they couldn't sell them at their estate sales. But in any case, yeah, they they would have somebody come in and and evaluate the uh, the uh, collection 
Um, and if again, if it's if, you know, if it's just three or four cases of wine, and they're not, you know, they're inexpensive wines for daily drinking. Uh, you know, and the the dad uh, was the wine drinker, and he's passed on, and uh, nobody else wants them. They're probably not worth anything. Okay. So, any more questions, so, Judy? I, no, but what I'm thinking is, Jim, would you consider putting together maybe a list of some of these sites that you've recommended and stores, sure. at least in Washington state, <clears throat> where they could store their wines if they wanted to. So we could post that on our website uh, as one of our giveaways. And so people who are interested in finding out more about storing or selling or donating their wines could go there and get that information, get that little freebie from us. Would you mind doing that? I would uh, be happy to do that. Super. I don't think I have any other questions. I, that was, I knew, I mean, I know that he knows an awful lot about wine because I've been around him all this time. So, Well, I'm just thinking of my, my parents who stored the wine in the garage that wasn't insulated uh -huh. and, and, you know, temperature would go up and it'd be even hotter than your house so uh and cold in the winter so it well, you know, you know too what much good for it when wine goes bad right it's it's vinegar yeah <laughs> wine then that, wine gar bad <laughs> yeah that means bad wine yeah <laughs> yeah you know i i've had uh wine that's been uh, improperly stored and and um uh and and had it be you know just just fine. I mean, it, it's not, it, nothing in wine is hard and fast. It's just, it, you know, it, this is what is best for wine. Sometimes, you know, wine that isn't stored uh, correctly uh, it tends to age faster. And, you know, the older I get, the, the more I would appreciate that, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> it ages faster and, you know, then is is uh, far more drinkable than, a wine that had been pro uh, properly stored. Now that's again, it's a gamble and it's a generalization too. So I think that's kind of the whole idea behind wine, isn't it? That there's always a risk. Yeah, yeah. It's you know, and it's it's a. Uh, I think one of the pleasures uh, of wine is you know, and an aging wine is when you open it, uh, and it, it, and you cut it right at the right moment. It's wonderful. Uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a. Uh, in, enchanting sort of thing uh conversely uh i i i kept much wine you know too long and I opened can it think up of one particular what was that thing where you had the you were going to do a vertical tasting do you remember that oh yeah gwenoc chardonnay that, that that started because i got a great deal on uh what was it? i think the 1980 vintage and i had uh when I got down to the last bottle, I bought I bought the next vintage, and then I bought the next vintage, and I was going to taste them uh, all together sometime. I don't know why it wasn't a particularly um, renowned uh, winery. It was it was fine, but uh, and I kept them too long, and uh, I decided to open them one day because one of the wines was leaking the uh, out of the cork and making a mess of my wine cellar. So. So I uh, pulled the cork. Uh, I, I was going to pull the cork and pour, pour them all down the drain, thinking they were all bad. And uh, the first one, the, the leaker, was bad. And I poured it down the drain. I opened the next one, poured it down the drain. And then I opened the next one, and it, God, it smelled really good. And I tasted it, and it was just marvelous. And I'm like, oh, God, why did I open this? But um, yeah, so storage conditions, I, uh, are and and uh, there are many times when when uh, uh, wine should have, should have been drunk. It's better to drink a wine too early than too late. And um, when it, it it's too late, it, it's often you know it, you you never know. Okay, good advice to go with. It's better to drink the wine too early than too late. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Jim. Appreciate the coming on and helping the folks who who have their wine collections and 
mm-hmm. maybe need to downsize, can't can't figure out what to do with them. I hope this is going to be helpful to them. Yeah, hope so too. All thank right, so that much. is it for our episode 20. We want to thank you for listening and or joining us on YouTube. Yeah, we really that? appreciate those folks who, of you who have contacted us and found out about us through our podcast. Uh, we're here to help, and that's our job. Give us a call, check out our, our websites, and thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. And that's it, folks. Thanks for listening. And stay tuned for future episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks. Goodbye.